I'm glad you clarified the motorized bike situation because my kid, who's 15, uh, told me he saw a guy on a motorized bike. He said, oh, that's really cool. He says, yeah, do you have to have a driver's license for that or do you have to have a registration? And I said, you know, I really don't know. I don't think so. Uh, and now I got it from the legislator's mouth. We don't, but in not fact, yet. that was an issue that, about whether or not it should require a driver's license. Oh, so this is not a done deal. This it, is no, 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 it is, a, it is a done deal. It got passed. It's totally law. It's been signed in the bill. But th that was one. Of, he's, it's an interesting point because that was one of the real issues we debated, whether we should require a driver's license for the motorized via bike or not. But really, it's an alternative for seniors who sometimes don't want to have to have a car or have to have a license. So and teenagers, made, too. Well, te <laughs> teenagers, too, exactly, apparently. So, yeah, no, you know license is required. <laughs> I told him, well, you're going to have to work for that. If you want the guitar in that, no way. I have um, a 15-year-old, too, and uh, <laughs> thankfully he's not yet driving. Uh, tell me a little bit more about lobbyists. You know, some of them, as you point out, uh, you know, we think of the word lobbyist as, uh, I always thought of them as kind of the bad guys representing big corporate interests. I'm sure there are lobbyists for progressive uh, groups. Uh, give me a little bit of a picture and our listeners a little bit of a picture about what, uh, what is the world of lobbyists. Yes, and a lot of the lobbyists for those progressive groups live in this district. It's great. So, you know, we have a group called Citizen Action, for example, which lobbies to try to make sure that we are putting in check better places for um, payday lending reforms. They focus on health insurance reforms. They do all sorts of those kinds of things. Um, we have a lot of environmental lobbyists, for example, the Environmental Law and Policy Center, where a lot of folks from that organization live in this district. Early childhood organizations have lobbyists down there trying to make sure that, uh, you know, all, all the research shows that if you invest in kids early and get them on the right track, much higher success. You, you lower all sorts of other problems. You know. So there's, very, there's lobbyists down there on very good issues um, as well. And, and we really do rely on them in, in, from information. Uh, we get so many bills that we have to vote on, you can't read every bill. So you really do rely on getting good information from lobbyists on what are the problems and what you need to really pay attention to. Well, let's look at some specific issues. Let's start with coal. Um, we had a guest on our show not too long ago named Jeff Biggers, who's a writer. He's written about, uh, you know, Mexico, and he's written about uh, coal. He's written about southern Illinois, and he is a writer for the Huffington Post, and he sends me a lot of information about coal. He's all over Durban who he voted for, I voted for, we support Durbin, but he basically makes the claim that Senator Durbin uh, really overlooks the negative stuff about Illinois coal uh, because of various interests and because it's an economic part of the state when we're really addressing the question of uh, climate in, our, in, our, in the world. Uh, can you tell me from your experience what is the, what's going on with coal in Illinois? I mean, uh, is there pressure to open up more coal fields? Is there pressure from uh, the environmental people that you've mentioned uh, to limit uh, coal extraction in Illinois? Give us a little hint on that. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely, the, there, there are a lot of issues around coal in Illinois. It is a big resource in Illinois, yeah. so there's always pressure to be able to tap in and use it. Um, a couple of different things that are, have been happening um, lately in Springfield around this. One, uh, we have gotten a planning um, grant to do um, clean coal and to see whether we can make that work. Uh, and so there is a big uh, project going on to see whether or not, in fact, clean coal can be made a reality or not. Some there's say that's, there's no such thing. Right. There's debate on that, yeah. but there, there's at least now in Illinois, look, see, can we make that a reality? Uh, the truth is that most of our power in Illinois is com does come from coal-generated plants. So, and that is, you know, obviously contributing heavily to our, you know, CO2 emissions. So there's big issues in that. Um, we have been doing a lot of other things that help develop the alternative energy uh, in Illinois as well. We're one of a few states that do have requirements that uh, the, the um, utilities in Illinois have to be having certain amounts of all their energy productions coming from alternative fuels by certain dates. So that is driving wind production, for example. We are now, we have the most wind development in production of any state in the country, which very few people know. So that there's some real More than positive Iowa. trends. More than Iowa. We have a great <laughs> Great wind change. More than here. Cape Cod. More than Cape Cod. <laughs> uh, in development. Yeah. Um, we don't have the most actually getting produced yet, okay, but good. of the wind farms that are in development, we have the most right now. I've always wanted to put a wind farm on the roof of the heartland here. We'll <laughs> see if we can pull that off. Uh, 
Let's talk a little bit more about other issues that, uh, that come up. Uh, let's just talk right now about uh, the state budget. What's, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, uh, looking around, I, we, you and I talked earlier this week about the, uh, who, what politician was going to switch the office that they were in and run for a different office. Uh, there seems to me to be a number of people who are in the state legislature uh, who are maybe giving up their seats and they're going to go on to other things, which it kind of, I was thought about it last night. I said, now this kind of concerns me. You know, we have these people who are, I mean, we got the, the ship is definitely listing. And uh, now we got people who've had experience and have had time in the practice who, are, who want out. Uh, what's your take on that? <clears throat> and what's your general take on where the state is at? The, the budget is uh, in horrible shape. Uh, and I think it was a, sort of an unconscionable budget that we put together this year. I, I voted no on it. Um, and um, what we did, we have a huge deficit. It's been developed over 10 years at least, where we've had, and we've been sort of ignoring it and doing all these very gimmicky solutions. So we've had our expenses growing faster than revenues that come into the state, and we do things to sort of patchwork it, uh, where we'll do things called fund sweeps, take away from certain funds and put it into the general fund to solve things, and, and do lots of borrowing and do short-term sa uh, sales of assets that the state has. We've been sort of ignoring, and this bud budget deficit's been growing. Now you have this economic recession coming on top, and we really have plummeted. Uh, our bond ratings are, have dropped precipitously. What we did this year is we borrowed $3.5 billion in a pension obligation note to fill our budget deficit, as well as our taking advantage of federal stimulus dollars. Now, those federal stimulus dollars are going to go away, and we're not going to be able to borrow $3.5 billion again. I mean, this is totally just kicking the can down the road and putting off our, our really solving the problem. So we've got a huge challenge. Um, you know, and, and this is voted on. I think people voted on heavily, majority of both Republicans and Democrats in Springfield voted for this budget. It is not uh, a one-party issue. It's an everybody issue down there. Uh, I think it, there may be some healthy degree that we need sort of new takes on how to solve these problems there, and people need to stand up and be able to take the hard votes and do the right thing to solve this. Right now well, we're not doing the citizens a service. Heather Staines, if you were running the show, how would you, what would you suggest that it gets done? Yeah, you know, and this is the frustrating thing to me is I don't think it's rocket science. And as I talk to my Republican colleagues as well as Democratic colleagues, I think there's a general consensus around the kinds of things that need to do, get done. It's like just pulling all the pieces together and actually knocking the heads to get it done, which, is, which can be a challenge in a political arena. Um, the kinds of things that need to happen is we need to have some real spending reforms. Um, we do need to take a look at um, going to a two-tier pension system where we would never want to touch the pensions for current employees, you can, but just future employees. We need to take a look at Medicaid reforms that actually improve health outcomes and ma better manage the way um, the costs are. We have this great, for example, program uh, in its infancy that brings people into primary care. People need to get more primary care coverage. We need to expand getting more folks more into primary care coverage so they're not going to the emergency rooms and getting more expensive, expensive care that also leads to worse outcomes because they're waiting too long. Things like that need to happen. And we do need to take a look at um, sort of right now health care coverage, for example, for state employees. We get, we pay very little uh, and that's not what happens in the private sector. So I think we do need to have the sense of shared sacrifice in how we're, we're, we're looking at things. So we need to do some spending things. Um, and then we also need to look at our revenues. I don't think we're going to be able to entirely cut our way out of this enormous deficit. And I think there's different creative ways we can be looking at it. Uh, our taxing situation right now is that we are very um, regressive. Our lower income folks pay a lot more in taxes than our higher income folks. So as we do this, I and think you're we, opposed to that. Yeah, I'm totally right opposed. On. We've got to be a lot more progressive <laughs> in the way we do taxing. But by our constitution, it's a flat tax, flat income tax. So that needs to get looked at as well. There's a, there's a lot of work to be done.